Hi, and welcome to worship at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church. Thank you so, so much for being here on this gorgeous fall day. I don't know if you have seen the leaves changing color and noticed that it's gotten a little cooler outside, but I've been breaking out my jean jacket and my sweaters and my boots because um, I absolutely adore fall weather. And so one thing I just want to make sure you don't miss out on this fall is going to a pumpkin patch or an apple orchard um, just because there are so many around here and it's such a fun fall activity to do as a family or with a group of friends. So don't miss it this year. Uh, but again, if you are just joining us, we are going through a sermon series on the Ten Commandments. And we're already halfway through. So last week we talked about the Fifth Commandment, which means this week we are talking about Commandment number six. Do you remember what it is? It's okay if not, because we'll go over it in the sermon later. And so you'll for sure know it after today. Uh, but again, just thank you so much for joining us today and making worship a part of your life. So without further ado, we begin worship in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Welcome to worship. A reading from Mark, the 10th chapter. Some Pharisees came and to test him, they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them. What did Moses command you? They said. Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house of the disciples asked him again about this matter. He said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. The word of the Lord. Well, grace and peace to you from the God who made us, the God who loves us, and the God who frees us for service in this world. Amen. So far, we've looked at these Ten Commandments, we've looked at the first five that you see here. Today we're on to the sixth one. Look at that, I've always kind of wanted to do that. I don't know if that works, but here we go. The sixth one, you shall not commit adultery. That's the sixth one that we're looking at today. So I saw one of you post on Facebook, the Ten Commandments according to Oli. He said this, There's only one Lena for every Oli, don't you know? No cheating. So I have to say, I truly consider myself blessed. I consider myself the luckiest man in the world. I have the best wife I could ever ask for, and I mean that. Uh, no need for a different Lena for this Oli. Alicia, I love you so much. Uh, and as we worship today, as we reflect on this commandment today, once again, I'm aware that we have a number of different uh, perspectives looking at this sermon. A variety of circumstances that prompt particular questions, concerns, questions about divorce, questions about abusive relationships, how do you preach about adultery to kids, teenagers, people who are single, to widows, widowers. You know, I believe that sometimes when we talk about this verse, this particular commandment, we can restrict its implications to only think of it in the context of a heterosexual married couple. But, as my new interpreter's Bible commentary depicts, in its fullest interpretation, the command against adultery envisions covenant relations of mutuality that are genuinely life-giving, nurturing, enhancing, and respectful. So, covenant relations of mutuality, that's what we're thinking about today. So what does that look like for you? What covenant relations of mutuality do you find yourself in? Now before we dive too deeply into this, I want to share five of my own just personal thoughts about adultery today. The first is that relationships have ripple effects. What I know about covenant relationships is that when there's conflict in it, there are ripple effects. When Alicia and I have disagreements, 
we realize it's not long afterwards that the kids start acting up. And it's easy then, out of our own frustration, guilt perhaps, to take it out on them, to punish them for acting up, but really, it's our own fault. It's our own relationship's fault. And it's important to address that first. So today, it's important to address relationships because what happens in the relationship doesn't just affect that one relationship. Healthy marriages, for instance, are good for the family and good for the community, too. So in the same way, adultery affects not just that relationship, not just the partner, but the greater community as well. Just look at the story of David and Bathsheba. Relationships have ripple effects. Number two, I also know that you don't need to be married to be complete. Just look at Jesus. Unfortunately, churches too often are unwelcoming places for single people. I want to be a church that intentionally has seven chairs around a table as a form of hospitality to show that we expect there to be odd numbers, not just even numbers. You don't have to be married to be complete. Number three. Forming covenant relationships between authentic people is an uphill battle. Here's what I mean. We live in a time and in a culture of individualism, self-authorship, and consumerism. So we're overwhelmed with messages that say, if you don't like something, just return it. If someone doesn't agree with you, find someone new that does. And in addition, we're a selfie generation, right? A photoshopped generation where we have the ability to distort who we present ourselves to be and have distorted understandings of who other people claim that they are. So this greatly challenges making real and trusting relationships. These forces are bigger than any one of us. So forming covenantal relationships between authentic people is an uphill battle these days. That's number three. Number four, when it comes to adultery, there are sins of commission, and I believe there's also sins of omission. The things we do and the things we fail to do. Both are destructive. Relationships take work, intentionality, communication, and a willingness to make compromises. If you avoid that necessary work, if you disengage, or you stonewall the other person, you're contributing to the problem. So when it comes to adultery, there are sins of commission and sins of omission. Things you do and things you fail to do that both contribute to the problem. That's number four. And number five, not every relationship can or should be saved. God doesn't want you to stay in abusive relationships. Just like the story of God delivering the Israelites from an abusive relationship with Pharaoh, if that's your story, I believe God wants to deliver you from that. I've lit this purple candle today, this purple candle today, because October is Domestic Abuse Awareness Month. And so we've got that candle lit today in awareness of that. People are complex. Relationships are unique and some are not healthy. Our ELCA social statement on sexuality says that divorce is tragic, but in some situations it may be the better option. We believe the church should be a community of care and hope for those who divorce rather than blaming, ostracizing, or being indifferent to their needs. So if you're in that boat today, I just want to let you know that our church has a divorce support group that you're welcome to attend because not every relationship can or should be saved. Now, switching gears, as we talk about the sixth commandment today, I couldn't help but think about how the story of Exodus mirrors our closest relationships, our marriages, even our relationships with God. So I invite you to live into this metaphor with me a little bit today. How might God's story in Exodus overlap with our stories of relationships as well? 
Let's take a look. So we like to think of our relationship starting when one person meets another person. But to be honest, the story oftentimes begins with a problem with someone else. The story starts with a bad relationship first. In Exodus, the Israelites were in a bad relationship with Pharaoh. That's how the story started. It's an abusive one. They weren't good for each other. One side gets all he wants all the time, and the other side has to either obey or be punished. It's unhealthy, and God didn't like that. So, maybe that's the case with you. I think about how often people find themselves knowing what they want in a relationship after learning what they don't want from the last relationship. <laughs> Sometimes a love story begins not just by starting something good, but by stopping something bad. In order to get together, first, oftentimes there's a break up. And in the story of Exodus, God commits to Israel. God saves them. The Israelites leave and cleave Pharaoh and trust this new relationship with God. But here's the interesting part about that story. You would think that after the Israelites left Pharaoh, that they would never look back. That they would move on and be grateful for this new relationship with God. A God who looks out for them, provides for them, saves them, is perfect for them. Literally, God is perfect for them. One chapter closes, the other should begin. But it turns out that this dividing line between chapters isn't so definite. You know, a professor of ours once said that for the Israelites, at first God took the Israelites out of Egypt. But after that, God still had to take Egypt out of the Israelites. <laughs> they had to be cleansed. They had to be cleansed of assuming that Moses was against them, that God was against them. They still had this pattern of thinking that God was, was going to do something against them because that's all they knew. That's all they believed. So they had to learn that God would help them and provide for them because they were used to a relationship with Pharaoh where Pharaoh didn't. And in the same way, when it comes to some of our relationships, even when we find ourselves in good relationships, we can still be recovering from bad ones. The ex can still occupy space in the mind and the heart of someone, even when they're out of the picture. God may have taken you out of a bad relationship, but you may still need God to take that bad relationship out of you. Nevertheless, what happens in Exodus is this new relationship between God and the Israelites, and it starts with a celebration. In Exodus chapter 15, there was a party, song and dance. It was a beautiful beginning of this new relationship. And in some ways, you could think of this as the honeymoon phase of the relationship, the first date, the wedding day. This is when everything looks great. This is what they've waited for their whole lives. This is the happiest day of their lives. It doesn't get any better than this. But then, sure enough, as soon as Exodus chapter 15 ends, that's when the tensions start. <laughs> In the Bible, right after this celebration in Exodus chapter 16, God's people start to complain. There's fights, there's conflicts. This perfect new relationship ends up having disagreements, frustrations, a lack of trust wishing they could even go back to Pharaoh back in Exodus chapter 12. Isn't that true of our relationships as well? There's a honeymoon phase, but then no matter who we are, as human beings we find ourselves caving into mistrust and criticism, conflict, and bitterness, frustration bubbles over. There's complaining, and sometimes, although it doesn't make any rational sense, there's a longing to go back to that previous relationship, even if you know it's not good for you. Well, in our lives, 
We think we want Exodus chapter 15 relationships. We think that if the celebration stops and the challenges start, that's a problem with our partner. And so when we find ourselves starting in chapter 16, when we find ourselves in Exodus chapter 16, we're tempted to find a new Exodus 15 relationship. But the story of humankind, the one we see depicted in the Bible, is one where relationships don't just automatically work. There's this cycle of separation followed by restoration, faithfulness followed by failure, followed by forgiveness, commitment followed by confusion, followed by reconciliation. Good relationships are defined not by an absence of challenge, but by reliable companionship through it all. So here's the thing. The promised land wasn't back in Exodus chapter 15. And the promised land certainly wasn't back in Exodus chapter 12. The promised land was still ahead. So as we get this commandment today, thou shalt not commit adultery, we're invited into covenant relationships of mutuality with others and with God that are genuinely life-giving, nurturing, enhancing, and respectful. On this journey forward, not backward, we're invited to choose forgiveness, reconciliation, effort, and fidelity over self-indulgence, temptation, lust, or greed. It may not be easy, automatic, natural, or photoshopped, but it's real. Which is what we all are, and that's who God wants us to be, with God and with each other. And in the best days, committed relationships of mutuality are a glimpse of the commitment and love that God has for us. So thanks be to God. I was lost with a broken heart. You picked me up, now I'm set apart. From the ash I was born again. Forever safe in the safest hands. 
Our mission at Holy Trinity is to welcome, worship, and respond. That's what we do. So as we prepare our financial commitments for the 2022 year here at Holy Trinity and the ministry that that entails, uh, we give as a response to what God has already given to us. Why give? Well, our family tithes 10%. And we believe that it's an act of responsibility, being intentional and proactive in our budgeting decisions, but also it's an act of faith and trusting that God will provide and realizing that God already has. For we give in response to what God has already given to us. Stewardship. Why do I give? I give because I love our church. Stewardship is our response to God's gifts in which we give our time, talent, and treasures to the church to carry on the ministries. We want to recognize God's work in our lives and respond to God with gratitude. As long as I have money for cat food, I can give to the church. I give because I trust in our leaders and know that they spend very wisely. I want to invest in our kids' programming and see them grow in their faith. And because this is my home, you are my church family. And I want to help and support all of us in all of the programming that we offer. Taylor, why do we give to the church? We give back to God what is God's, so that through our gifts, the love of God can become a tangible reality in our world. Our giving is a reminder of the blessings God gives us and gave us through His Son, Jesus Christ. Please take time to pray, study scripture, and decide what you would like to give. We commit to preparing for a 2022 with a prayerful and responsible budgeting process that reflects the values and priorities of this congregation. Once you've decided what you'd like to give, please return the enclosed estimate of giving card by placing it in the offering plates October 10th through the 27th mailing it into the church office, or filling it out on our online website. We have had a significant increase in those giving electronically through Simply Giving, which has greatly aided in the health of the church. If you are already set up with automatic giving, please submit an estimated giving card letting us know if you'd like your commitment to stay at the same or change. If you'd like to do so at this time, you can contact the church office or go on the website. We invite you to respond as God leads you, and we thank you in advance. Our Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And, and lead us not into temptation, temptation but, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Hello everyone, my name is Karen Taylor, and on behalf of all of the staff here at Holy Trinity, I want to thank you for joining us for worship today. Here at Holy Trinity, it's our mission to share God's love with all people from one generation to the next. Here are some great ways that we can all do that this week. I want to point out our HDLC connections. Now typically I talk about this a little later in my announcements, but this week we are featuring a great main page article that ties in with our stewardship theme and it's called from dolls to meals sandy Schenecker, a great member of our congregation and the missions outreach team shared her story about how she found these cuddle and kind dolls and what this company does besides make really super cute dolls now we give these dolls to all of our children that are being baptized but these dolls have a second mission 
And so I encourage you to read that story. You can find it either in our newsletter, HTLC Connections, or on our HTLC Chronicles blog. Both of those you can find at our website, holytrinityonline.org. Now I mentioned that it's Stewardship Month, and so most of you have received your Estimate of Giving card. Now the coolest thing, look at this, it comes with a stamped envelope. You don't even have to spend a stamp to send back your Estimate of Giving. Now this Estimate of Giving is really important, it helps us budget the church year. And that way we can figure out how much we're going to give for missions, how much we're going to spend on our children, youth, and family programming, how much we're going to spend, be able to, to spend on our great Wednesday night meals. So it really does help out plan the 2022 year. <laughs> I can't believe we're already into 2022. Now, another great thing that we are doing for the community is our um, annual trunk or treat. Now, if you've never participated in this, it's a very fun event. Adults, you're going to come to the parking lot, decorate yourselves and your trunk. So imagine uh, a parking lot full of cars and the trunks are open and they're all decorated in different themes. And there's going to be children walking all around our parking lot, going from trunk to trunk, collecting your goodies. So it's a really safe way to promote uh, Halloween. It's a fun way to gather as a church community and we're opening up to the entire community of New Prague. So spread the word. We want to make this a great event. Now, if you're interested in having a trunk, we do ask that you RSVP your trunk. So we allot a parking lot space for you. So go to our website, Holy Trinity Online and make sure you click trunk RSVP. Another thing you'll find on our website is the registration for our new member class that's coming up November 7th. Now this is going to be online from 1030 in the morning till noon. So once you click that registration button on our website, it will bring you to a sign up genius. And then once you sign up there, Jamie, our office manager, will send you the Zoom link. So easy peasy. It's a great way for people to meet each other. And that way our new members, we record their little greeting and it can be shown on our online worship. It is shown in person worship. So everybody gets to meet our new members. Now, I also wanted to give a quick update about our sign. We have been collecting funds for a new digital sign. Hallelujah. We received all of the funds we needed. We raised over $85,000 in one month. So congratulations, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for giving those donations. And make sure you check out the website for a very sweet thank you note written by Janice Jaspers. Just click on the, the thank you note there. And a last reminder of how you can give your offering to Holy Trinity. First way is you can send in your, your envelope and uh, maybe even remember to send in your estimate of giving card. Uh, so you mail that into the church office. Second way is by simply giving. There's a PDF form on our website that you can fill out. You can also send that in to Jamie in the office. And that way you can choose to have it withdrawn from a savings account, a checking account, whatever works for you. And then the third way is the Vanco Faith app. So you can set it up on your phone. You can do a weekly giving. You can do it uh, each time you remember. But it's a great way to digitally give your offering. That's it for me. Let's have a great week. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus.